this is this is a this is in relation to Craigslist and backlist, which right. I, I think Craigslist gets a, a lot of the publicity. But for a Craigslist, you know, look, a, a sex worker who is going to answering calls and going to a person's home, is there any more vulnerable position to put yourself in to walk into a stranger's house? Yeah. I mean, you're talking about really uh, taking an enormous risk. But in generalized terms, yep. there is a, there's often... Um, and that's not an, there's often an addiction involved and that's not a judgment but the point is the mind is altered to to do that type of career um, I'm not saying everybody but I think that plays a role in it but you're right in generally speaking for the minds that we work Wait, from one second ahead. Walter Three, doing a mic check four, five six seven eight nine ten okay so my audio is coming through I'm sorry continue um it, it's just that you know that that we we sort of approach it. Why would you do that? You're going to a stranger's house, but I don't think that we have the. We obviously don't have the same mindset of somebody who has chosen that way to, uh, quote unquote, make a living, and we don't have the same background. Where you know, I think again, often that addictions are involved. Right. So the mind is not as clear because you're right. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. And we have it on wfla.com. Amber Cost Costello uh, had had struggled with drug addiction. And and by and my comments, by the way, are, are in no means is that in any relation whatsoever to uh, associating blame as far as Absolutely that not. career. Absolutely, Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Just making note of the fact that any career where you're showing up and walking into a stranger's home, whether it's whether you're a sex worker or otherwise, any 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 chosen line of work that 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 exists out there, if you're walking into a home that you're unfamiliar with. There's all automatically risk associated with that. If you do not know 100%. the person, especially if you're doing it late at night, especially if you're doing it in a remote area or under the cover of darkness where there's not a lot of you know witnesses or people walking by, you're putting yourself in a vulnerable position. Um, so, of course, we're here live, Walt Buteau, J.B. Buno, and we're about to launch live across all platforms in approximately 10 minutes in advance of this 4 o'clock Eastern Time press conference, uh, the Gilgo Beach uh, serial murder suspect. Uh, his name again, Rex Huerman, uh, 59 years old. Uh, Walt, uh, I'm going to go through the timeline here uh, that we have from Pix11. Uh, are you hanging out for a bit, or, you, I, or you I've got to... like five, ten minutes? But yeah, definitely. Okay, really quick, I'm going to go through the timeline. This is going back to December of 2010. This is uh, per Pix11, our sister station. Uh, they say that a Suffolk County police canine discovered human remains. In, at Gilgo Beach of a different woman while they were searching for any signs of Shannon Gilbert, 24 years old, from Jersey City. That victim, uh, found on December 11, 2010, was later identified as Melissa Bartholomew. December 13th, uh, just two days later, the remains of three more bodies are found in the same location at Gilgo Beach, all within 500 feet of one another. So can you imagine that? I mean, I mean, you were talking about you're searching for one missing woman and within a 48 or so hour period, you're finding the remains of four different people. And now you want now you are more than likely going to stay out there and, and expand and expand what you're searching for. Keep in mind that of the four at this point, Shannon Gilbert is Thank not you. there. Thank you for but the Shannon heads up. Gilbert remains missing. And then four, my first YouTube live the, stream, the remains of four people are found waiting to hear the police press conference. December 15th, 2010, the FBI offers to help in the investigation. December 16th, Suffolk County Medical Examiner's Office reports that the remains found are female victims and Shannon Gilbert is not one of the four bodies discovered. You got to take the phone. OK. That phone rang, folks. So Walt will come back in here momentarily as we go over the timeline again. Police in January, a month later, police identify a victim as Megan Waterman. January 24th, 2011. So uh, a week or so after that, police release the identity, identities of the three remaining victims, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, and Amber Lynn Costello. Suffolk County, uh, Suffolk County District Attorney Thomas Spoda uh, declares that a serial killer is responsible for these young women's deaths. So um, that was when, I mean, so the bodies of, of four were really the remains of four women are found in Gilgo Beach. 
everyone's thinking, do we have a serial killer? And that was when, in, on January 24th, they definitively told the media and told the public that a serial killer is responsible for these deaths. I mean, can think about how... how so the Long Island serial killer. In a community. Or how, how many, thinking, how many different suspects have you guys heard of conclusion over the years? Um, so there's, the one that always stuck with me was somehow, Robert uh, Durst for a while was getting looked at for it. At least people were speculating. All victims at that stage in the investigation worked as escorts using Craigslist. I would think there has to be another connection other than that, Police? right? Yep. Something about- So targeting sex workers who are using online advertising makes me think it's someone with a sort of high, uh, high powered career. So he's scheduling his kills, right? He's not stalking, he's scheduling. And police find a skull, forearm and hands. Police declared that the fifth set of remains are not those of Shannon Gilbert. So keep in mind, they have not found, found Shannon Gilbert up until this point, and five female bodies, uh, or the remains from five female bodies are discovered uh, near in the Gilgo Beach area. April 4th to 5th, 2011, so fast forwarding about a week, police discover three additional sets of human remains, bringing the total body count to eight. Shannon Gilbert, again, not among the bodies discovered. So Shannon Gilbert missing eight bodies now. April 11th, police discover two more sets of remains in separate locations along Ocean Parkway, bringing the total number of bodies in the Gilgo Beach serial killings to 10. December 13th, fast forward six months, Shannon Gilbert's body is discovered in an Oak Beach marsh about a mile away from her belongings. So my goodness. A double-digit body count in the search for Shannon Gilbert, and it becomes clearly evident to to uh, uh, officials, to to investigators, that they have a serial killer right. on their hands. But obviously, at this point, there are charges involving only three of the victims. So you have to. So I, the assumption is going to be, oh, he all ten are involved, but they're not. Um, now, logic would tell you. Ten bodies found in the general area, same general area. Yeah, you know, yeah. Ocean Park. All, all, yeah, but again, all, you, all Ocean you wonder, Parkway. I've driven Ocean Park. I know I'm familiar with Ocean Parkway. But you, so you, so you, you, you wonder. You know, one question for that for the uh, news conference is, um, you know, how what's the difference in connecting the three and not connecting the other seven? Right. What, what do you have? Something, what, something dif differentiated. You have a the little three. bit more. That's right. On those three, somehow. I'm Maybe guessing there's the some DNA. kind of phone records. Pizza crust story <clears throat> is correct. Maybe it's the DNA. Real quick, folks, I want to show you this live feed here again. I'm not satisfied with the quality of this feed, and I'm sure our audience also looking at this and being like, my goodness. So Someone in the I'm police talk to our team here in the stream center. We're going to mute, mute microphones here for just a minute. Stand by for 30 seconds as we talk to our team to, to kind of get a better version of this signal. Stand by. All right, so the up, update, folks. There's a police press conference at 4 p.m. That's mainly what we're waiting for. I'm live streaming this other live stream that's going to show the, the police press conference. Um, you know the Long Island serial killer case has been something that um, comes in and out of public attention since 2011 or so, right? Um, I did not see the Lost Girls documentary on Netflix. Um, anything in there that that you guys have thought about. Yes, hello, first live stream. <clears throat> so, right, the if we if we think about like what what kind of person All right, is, we're back. Okay, hold on. As this is a result of an enormous contingency of media being crammed in one room. It reduces the strength That's somehow because right. they're Cause all using all the same band. Everything's coming signal. out over the internet. And so when you try to cram 50 toothpicks in one straw, this is what you get as a result. That's my We need very 6G. Do we have 5G yet? Uh, so have you guys heard about the, the suspect who was arre arrested was Rex Hewerman, who was a Manhattan architect. Um, the New York Post reported that there is uh, some DNA evidence in this case uh, that they had followed it sounds like they got DNA from a pizza crust eaten by this suspect that they connected with one of the murders. 
um, for them to have gotten DNA in the first place. Presumably they were surveilling this guy. I think from, from what I can tell, the reason for surveillance may have had something to do with uh, phone records or other electronic devices that put the suspect in Midtown Manhattan, at least. Um, so he was always targeting sex workers who were advertising online and things like this. Uh, that part of it is what makes me think it, it would have been someone who was uh, doing this almost like on a schedule. Like it wasn't someone, uh, wasn't someone like BTK that was like stalking for a while um, these victims, like dedicating their like daily life to stalking. It was someone who was like had this urge that almost had to fit in. Just like, can I find someone online? Go kill someone. There's also this kind of binge quality to it where there were so many bodies discovered in a short period of time but then when was the last body that they've actually implicated the this serial killer in i think it's been like 10 years fall under one victim's response, or excuse me, one suspect's responsibility. They believe that there is more than one person responsible for this, so that uh, they don't believe that Rex Hurman is the only suspect that's in these killings. That's interesting. Let me also point out, too, that... Um, but it's also extremely coincidental, beyond belief to some degree, that you'd find 10 bodies in generally the same area. Do you know the area? I mean, is it... it, it, it well, what, they, what's well, the look, farthest well, hold on, hold part on. that... Let me, let me explain. I do know the area, but Gilgo Beach is not the beach you go to on Saturday with your friends and, and, and are drinking like Margaret. It, it, it's, it's, this area is very marshy. Okay. And it's very... Um, More of a beach walk sort of setting. Even, and that might even be... A, that's, that's a stretch. Right? Clamming? It, or I, clamming? Look, look, it, it's, it's just not... It's I, not... I get, I get it. It's, a, it's sort of a... I've, dri I've been on Ocean Parkway in the past, but I've it. never I've really seen, been to Gilgo yes. Beach. I've never been there. Right. It's Even not Pismo. No, it's not Clearwater Beach. It's not Clearwater Beach. No, it's right. a it's a beach, but it's more of a like you said, marshy. So it's secluded. Yes, it is secluded. But do we know the do we know how close the bodies, the proximity of the bodies? We do, and it, well, at least the first eight were, I believe. Hold on, oh, excuse me, the first four were all found within five hundred feet of each other. Okay. And that's close. So that's the Gilgo but Four. To think there's six others, even if it's, and they're all in G the Gilgo Beach area, that just makes you wonder: is that the place? The the for ten some bodies were discovered bodies all between 2010 I mean, and 2011. There, yeah, are, but know, the murders about, were thought to have taken you know, place over in the, in a significantly longer period of time. Stuff, and I think every region has one of those places. So the majority of the bodies, they just ended up finding when they were looking for a known missing person, and then they incidentally found up to 10 total bodies. Somehow common knowledge that that's a good place to dump a body, that's frightening, actually. Well, it is. If that's the case. It's it, certainly it, an it makes area. It's more frightening if it's one. It's more frightening if it's more than one than it's, if it's just one. It's, yeah, we're, talking about, we're talking about 10 Ten sets of human remains that were found in the search for Shannon Gilbert 13 years ago. Ten families that lost, lost someone. Utterly insane. Yeah. I mean, uh, just, and um, my goodness, you think about the, uh, you think about the, the victims' families and you just can't even imagine what they have been through and, and not having answers all these many years later. And now it gets opened up again and, um, and, it, they, and the answers will come somewhat slowly. You know, we'll have this news conference, but of course they're going to, I'm sure. Uh, the crew, why, why were you surprised the police the details, cooperated? And, and we won't find out a lot right away, and then it'll trickle out. As paperwork is filed, as evidence is uncovered, as search warrants are issued for perhaps other scenes or sites uh, that are tied to the defendant, you'll find out more information in those affidavits. All right, let's see here who is walking up. And uh, now that we have our, our feed situation uh, fixed, we're going to launch live across all platforms. Stand by. WFLA now will begin momentarily.
So curious to, to hear, usually at these first press conferences, the police are going to say a lot of uh, we can't comment at this time kind of answers. Um, I am curious, though, because it was in his so it was in his bail. Um, the sort of documentation to say he should be held without bail is what included the DNA, uh, the, the idea that they have DNA evidence. So we may at least hear about that. New York authorities have made an arrest in the Gilgo Beach serial murders from more than 13 years ago. The suspect, a Long Island architect, has pleaded not guilty this afternoon and we're moments away from a press conference where we're expected to learn more information about an arrest more than a decade in the making. Hello there to you folks. JB here with you live now officially across all platforms on W. FLA now. We were just live with Walt Buteau, our senior investigator. He had to step away for other stories that are unfolding today. I see. Uh, I hadn't heard that about the local police, Florida. the crow. This was the scene uh, earlier on today uh, in Massapequa on I Long see. Island in <clears throat> New York. It would make sense if it were someone in the police force, yeah. Rex Huerman. I'm going to show you the home here. Um, excuse me. Show you Rex Huerman here from his website, Rex Huerman Consultants and Associates. He is the suspect that has been arrested and now pleaded not guilty uh, in the. Uh, so he's a guy who lived, to the lived on Long Island his whole life. Megan Waterman but worked and in Amber Manhattan. Costello. Amber Costello, uh, who used to live in right here in the Tampa Bay area in Clearwater, uh, Florida. Uh, there has been a lot of difficulty with many media organizations descending on Riverhead, New York. Uh, the signal out of this room Oof. is not just good. horrendous. Uh, and this is a scenario that is unfolding for a lot of different media organizations that are having difficulty calibrating any kind of a meaningful signal because this is the most highly anticipated press conference of the day without a, without a doubt. Uh, social yes, media, of course, CNN's um, schedule about uh, this signal is any better. It's not even streaming on CNN, though. Uh, going back to 13 years ago Yet. when body after body remains after remains, they just continuously kept, kept getting found uh, in Gilgo Beach, uh, New York. Uh, as they were searching for, authorities were searching for at the time, missing 24-year-old woman Shannon Gilbert. So those first four that were within like 400 yards of Gilgo Beach, you have to think are all the same. They're saying that the 10 may not all be the same person. Over uh, those weeks, those exhausting days and weeks, uh, they would just continuously find more human remains. And every time they sent off the human remains to determine who that person was, it was another female and it was not Shannon Gilbert. They kept finding all of these remains until the body count reached double digits. And uh, of course, these victims, um, uh, their families have been, uh, been just uh, praying for justice for more than a decade now. So because and of the burlap sacks has been made that most of them were discovered in, there was talk that who the suspect would be someone that had access to burlap sacks. Do this. Uh, Rex Huerman uh, pleading not guilty on uh, in a Long Island arraignment uh, just this <clears> afternoon. <throat> so we're trying to get a, an improved signal here for you folks, uh, but as of right now, uh, the signal uh, continuously is breaking up due to the high volume of media presence uh, at the location of the District Attorney's Office of Suffolk County. This is Riverhead, New York, and we're trying to recalibrate this signal to get uh, the press conference um, back here for you. We'll do our very best. Uh, to bring it here to you live. Hmm. One of the reasons why there's a lot of people work moving around right now is because they're trying to improve the signal quality. But as I explained earlier, as far as the uh, the analogy that I can use to describe what it's like. Yes, I watched that video earlier of the. Uh the 20 minute video with like the French, the French interviewer from a realty company. And I actually made a short out of it because there's this strange comment he makes about, uh, he, he's talking about building furniture at some point during the interview. And he says, a tool I use in every job is a, a carpenter's hammer. And it's, it's a very, it's just persuasive enough when something needs to be persuaded. And the interviewer goes, some, something, right? Not someone. And he's like, something needs to be persuaded. But my reaction was that it was such a strange word to call a hammer persuasive. If you were talking about building furniture, right? But he does look like a totally normal guy. 
Uh, this is uh, news that has haunted this community uh, in Long Island uh, for a long time, and now it has really taken a turn for those in Massapequa uh, because they have been, uh, if New York officials are correct, if investigators have their man and they are indeed right, uh, if, if this person, Rex Hjorman, 59 years old, is the suspect responsible for at least these three murders, uh, then they have, this has been a, a frightening reality because they have been living uh, maybe on the same street or going to, to work or taking the Long Island Railroad all with this person for a period of more uh, than a decade. Uh, I'm going to step away for a moment to try to recalibrate this signal, but the press conference hasn't started just yet. We expect it to begin uh, sometime in the next few minutes. Again, they called it for 4 o'clock Eastern Time. The time now, 4.04 Eastern Time. Stand by. So if you, if you look at his, I mean, the victim profile, vast majority are All right, petite good news women. here for you folks. A, All are sex another workers who are advertising. Is, uh, starting <clears> so quite predatory, uh, which as is soon as we have serial feed, killers in general uh, are... Uh, uh, go to this essentially in uh, intraspecies predators, right? But just like a predator would target vulnerable or wounded animals, um, this kind of target profile is very, very much serial killer esque, uh, killerish, not, not passion, right? Uh, this press conference expected to begin momentarily. If you've just found this live stream and are looking for information, don't go anywhere. And just like we were talking about, the tug of war, right? The other feed looks awful. This one has now. Uh, reached HD quality. So All we'll right. stay here with you live on this feed as we're about to get. Thank you to WFLA to News anyway. for getting us this feed. Folks, I just communicated with our team. We now have three feeds up coming into the Stream Center. Uh, and being able to, of course, bring you this coverage here from the Stream Center, we're able to get a lot of different feeds loaded up here. But by far, the, the toothpick that is winning, so to speak, as far as uh, the analogy I was making earlier, this is the best feed. And we'll stay with this feed. Again, the press conference is expected to begin momentarily. Again, uh, the highly anticipated information. And actually now, I think we have, oh no, I thought that that was officials walking in. Or no, this is actually the press conference. I believe this is beginning now. After the press conference is over, what we are gonna do is we are gonna take your comments and questions live. So after the press conference, we'll break down what we have learned and what we are still to learn here from New York. Again, this is live on all platforms on WFLA Now, live from the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. Um, you know, I'm standing here with uh, my law enforcement partners in the Gilgo Task Force uh, to announce uh, the indictment of Defendant Rex Andrew Hureman, 59 years of age. Uh, he's been arrested by the Suffolk County uh, Police Department's homicide detectives, and he's been indicted uh, in a grand jury present, uh, presentation by the, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office uh, for the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Uh, the, the investigation of Maureen Brandon Barnes is ongoing. Uh, these young women went missing between July of 2007 and September of 2010. They were found in De uh, December of 2010 by the Suffolk County Police Department 
and then there was nothing, absolutely nothing. For, their, for the next 13 years, their cases went unsolved until today. Uh, when I took office in January 2022, I made uh, Gilgo a priority. I made Gilgo a priority before I took office. I met uh, with the victims' families, uh, some of whom I'm proud to have standing with us today, and I told them that we were gonna handle this case differently. We were gonna do it differently. And that when I showed up, you weren't gonna see me calling the media and being on Gilgo Beach with a giant uh, uh, magnifying lens looking for clues 12 years after the case. What I was going to do was I was going to work with my task force. We were gonna form, a task force. form this task force and we were gonna to work together and we were, going to, we were going to use the grand jury, the power of the grand jury to, cut, to, to reach a determination in this case. Because the grand jury has two things. It has power, it has reach. You could obtain documents, you could interview witnesses. But the other thing that the grand jury has, the grand jury has secrecy. No one knows what you do when you operate a grand jury proceeding. And we knew that when we were investigating this case and it, when we dealt with the media or whatever it was we were doing, um, we, were, we were playing uh, before a party of one because we knew uh, the person responsible for these murders would be looking at us. So we were very careful uh, how we, we, we handled the investigation. We maintained the integrity of the investigation. Uh, most, important, uh, most importantly of all, we maintained the secrecy uh, of that investigation. And I think that's, uh, that's paid dividends uh, as we've seen today. Now, um, I, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, when we had the, uh, the task force, uh, the first thing we did, got together with uh, um, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison, uh, and we formed the task force. Our first meeting uh, was February, February 1st of 2022. Uh, and what we did, what all of the agencies here, we made the commitment. We were going to take our talented, our most talented investigators. So in the district attorney's office, we took uh, uh, ADAs, myself included. We took analysts. We took detective investigators. And they worked on a daily basis with other talented investigators from all of the agencies here. Um, and uh, we started that in February 1st, in 2022. Six weeks later, on March 14th, 2022, the name Rex Hurman was first mentioned as a suspect uh, in the Gilgo case. A New York State uh, investigator was able to, uh, to um, identify him in a database, uh, and from that point on, we used the power of the grand jury, over 300 subpoenas and search warrants, uh, looking into this, this individual's background, to bring us to this day. So I'm, I am, uh, I'm proud, I, I know that this case is over, but I'm proud of what we've accomplished up to this point. I know we have more to accomplish, but I'm also uh, thankful, thankful for the partnership uh, of, of the task force, because certainly without the participation of the task force, we wouldn't be standing here. Um, you know, before I, I, you know, I thank some, some folks and, and turn it over to, uh, to uh, our, our partners. I just want to talk a little bit about the, the evidence in the case. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people know about the case. As I indicated, uh, the, uh, the victims went missing between July of 2010 and September, uh, I'm sorry, July of 2007 and uh, September of 2010. Uh, and uh, in December of 2010, they were, uh, the, their, their bodies were recovered. Uh, they were buried in a similar fashion, in a similar location. Um, uh, in, a, in a similar way. Uh, all the women were petite. Uh, they were, um, they, they all did the same thing for a living. Uh, they all advertised the same way. Uh, and there were, uh, immediately, there were similarities with regard uh, to, the, to the, uh, the crime scenes. Uh, all, the women's, all the women were bound at the head, uh, at the midsection, uh, uh, or at the chest, and later at the legs. Um, the other thing I think that, that um, uh, was was uh, that's been talked about in the uh, in the media was they were bound by um, burlap 
media, uh, that has taken a life of its own in the media, and the burlap has, has been described or thought to be uh, the burlap that's used at a nursery. For, uh, it, that's not the burlap that was used in this case. The burlap is, it was camouflage burlap uh, used for duck blinds of hunting. Um, uh, so uh, I, obviously it, it, it was used to hide, uh, purposely hide the bodies. Um, one thing that became immediately apparent uh, th was at the time of the, uh, each of the murders, uh, the murderer, the, the defendant, Herman, uh, he got a, a, uh, he got a, a cell phone uh, and a burner phone, which, uh, which is prepaid and anonymous. And for each of the murders, he got an individual burner phone, and he used that to communicate with the victims. Uh, then shortly after uh, the death of the victims, uh, he then would uh, would get rid of the burner phone. Uh, and uh, right away in December of 2012, uh, FBI uh, cast analysts, uh, special agents with the cast unit of the FBI, they immediately began looking at that cell site uh, uh, data. They compared the victims' phones with uh, with the burner phones, and they immediately uh, honed in on some, some sim similarities specifically uh, in the Massapequa Park area. And they looked at the, an area of a confluence of four cell towers. Uh, and they realized that this was, had uh, significance because uh, the, the uh, per perpetrator of these crimes was probably located within this area uh, during, at or around the times of the murderer. Uh, and that was mapped out. That was called the box. And it was an area uh, in Massapequa Park. Uh, the FBI also managed to do that for an area in mid Midtown Manhattan. Um, and so that was, that was an investigative lead. The other uh, investigative lead at the time was, even though there, there was a significant amount of time that elapsed with regard to uh, before the, 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 uh, the victims were recovered, there was some, uh, some significant evidence recovered. Uh, specifically, there was a uh, um, hair recovered from Maureen uh, Brainerd Barnes from a belt buckle that was around her legs. Uh, there, uh, with regard to Megan Waterman, uh, there were three hairs recovered um, uh, from, from her, uh, one uh, from around her head area, one from around her, her, her leg area in the burlap, and then there was one caught in between the tape. Uh, and uh, that was recovered. Uh, Amber Costello also had a hair, a significant hair that was recovered uh, during the time, uh, during the, the time of the recovery. But uh, again, uh, the crime scene, because it was out there for so long and because uh, it was exposed to the elements, uh, those hairs were degraded, so you couldn't use traditional DNA um, analysis on it. You would, uh, you would have to wait uh, and use mitochondrial DNA. And back in uh, 2010, the technology wasn't there for mitochondrial DNA. So the investigation proceeded, but also technology proceeded as well. Uh, and then in January and February of 2022, we, we formed the task force. We began working uh, collectively. Uh, and then a mere six weeks later, on March 14th, 2022, Rex Hurman was identified for the first time uh, and the manner in which that was done was uh, the New York State investigator looked at a database. Uh, Amber Costello, the day before her uh, disappearance on September 1st, uh, 2010, uh, she, uh, uh, con uh, she um, met with an, an individual for the purposes of, of having him pay her money uh, for, for her services. Um, but she... Uh, she would involve, she involved herself in a ruse where once the, the individual gave her, uh, gave her money, and, uh, uh, other individuals came into the, the house, pretended to be a significant others, confronted the individual uh, with the purpose of, of making that individual uncomfortable, having him leave without retrieving his money. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, so uh, that individual was identified as, as a person who was between 6'4 and 6'6". Six, six. Uh, a, a large man, thickly built, not necessarily overly muscular, but just a naturally uh, big person. Oh, so they have with witnesses glasses, too. White uh, and, and dark hair. Uh, also of significance was um, that the fact that he was driving a dark colored or black 
uh, av uh, uh, first uh, first generation uh, Chevrolet Avalanche with a, a, a very uh, unique feature that was between the, the it's a pickup truck, so it was between the cab and the bed, uh, and that was identified. Again, that was back uh, in uh, 2010. Uh, but it, w it wasn't until uh, March of, of, of 2022 uh, that that database uh, was, by, was, was, dis was searched uh, by the, the task force, uh, and this individual uh, uh, was, was identified. Uh, that, uh, that individual was uh, Rex Heurman, the defendant. Uh, and right away, there were some com commonalities that came right to the fore. Rex Heurman, 6'4", largely... Uh, a large person, not necessarily uh, muscular, but a, a very uh, physically large person. Uh, he has glasses. Uh, he has he has that the dark hair, and also a particular note. He owned at the time that first generation Chevy Avalanche. Uh, but there was more. Uh, he lived at 105 First Avenue, which was located within that box area that the FBI first. Uh, discovered in, in 2012, uh, but there was more. Uh, also, he worked at the time at an architect, as an, uh, he owned his own architectural firm uh, at an address at 19 West 36th Street in Mid Midtown Manhattan, and that was also the area of interest that was identified by the FBI in 2012. Uh, again, that was March 14th, uh, 2022, uh, and from that point on, our, our partners and uh, my office, we used the grand jury to continue to investigate, and we executed over 300 subpoenas, search warrants pertaining to this individual to find out more information. Uh, one of the things that we did is we followed him because we wanted to get an abandonment sample of his DNA, uh, which we were able to do. Uh, we also got uh, DNA samples, abandonment samples from his family. And then we went back and we got mitochondrial DNA testing. And with regard to... So they got a pizza um, slice, you know, a pizza and, crust from know, him, uh, there's an according to the bail a, documents. There's an aspect of New York according State New York law Post. that doesn't allow me to talk about uh, DNA testing, uh, specifically at press conferences. It's, um, so I can't do that. However, at the, um, at the uh, uh, arraignment, uh, and also, when we filed our bail letter, we talked about the significance of that uh, evidence. So if anyone needs to see that, but, but uh, suffice to say, uh, that evidence was, was significant, uh, especially with regard to uh, the other evidence that we had developed. But it was, uh, there was uh, another interesting aspect. We looked at the Yerman family uh, travel records, and we learned that during the murders of uh, the last three women, um, Bartholome, Waterman, and Costello, that during the commission of those murders, the, the, uh, the defendant's wife and children were, at, were out of New York State, and he was alone in the tri-state area. Uh, we also went back and looked at his cell site records, and we, were, we, we compared his personal cell site records with that of the four target phones, and we saw that there was areas of commonality. In other words, that whenever the, the target phones would, uh, would, would bounce off a cell tower, if, if the uh, Yerman uh, personal phone uh, bounced off a, a, a tower, it was always consistent and in close proximity uh, with the target phones. And at no time was there ever an instant where those target phones were, for instance, in New Jersey while uh, the defendant was, was yeah, I can't line. imagine being this guy's uh, so wife and kids right now. Um, uh, consistent. The other thing that we looked at was uh, we looked at his use of burner phones, uh, and we we followed using the grand jury, using the great investigative help from our partners. We followed his use of burner phones. We were able to uh, identify seven separate burner phones that he used. We were able to use fictitious. Uh, or fraudulent email addresses and get Google warrants. And from there, we got his searches. Uh, and we learned uh, what, we, what, uh, the what the defendant was searching. Uh, in a 14-month period, he had over 200 searches pertaining to uh, the Gilgo investigation. Uh, not only were those, uh, was he looking at 
uh, in investigative insight. Uh, he was looking, trying to figure out how is the task force using cell phones to try to figure out what's happening. What are the developments with regard to the task force? And this, uh, this really um, um, supported our decision to keep our investigative um, focus secret because we knew that this one person would be watching and we didn't want to give him uh, any insight into what we were doing. And we also didn't want him to know just how close we were getting. Uh, so we maintain the, the, the grand jury secrecy and we maintain the integrity of our investigation. Uh, in addition to those, those uh, um, uh, Gilgo searches, he was searching, compulsively searching pictures of the victims, but not only pictures of the victims, pictures of their, uh, their uh, relatives, their, their, their sisters, uh, their children, uh, and he was trying to locate those individuals. Uh, in addition to that, there was a lot of uh, torture, uh, porn, and, and uh, um, what you would consider, uh, you know, uh, um, depictions of women uh, being abused, uh, being raped, and being killed. Um, in addition to all of that, uh, we continued to look uh, and... Uh, At least one of the victim's we, uh, sisters got taunting to, calls, uh, by the determine, way. Uh, that, that Chevy Avalanche that was used during the commission of the Amber Costello crime uh, that Chevy Avalanche was in South Carolina. And again, with the help of our uh, partners, uh, we were able to capture, uh, we were able to seize that uh, uh, Chevy Avalanche pursuant to a search warrant and was certainly- I agree, a horrific that. day for, in addition to that, for all involved, uh, but pursuant to the arrest at least the, the families might have night, some beginning County, of closure. Uh, right? police department, we, we obtained one of his burner phones, his last burner phones. Uh, the investigate, as I said, the, this case is not over. It's only beginning. We're continuing to execute search warrants, and we anticipate getting more evidence. Uh, before I, I turn it over to my partners, I, I, I want to I wanna thank a lot of people in the room. First and foremost, I want to thank the victims in this case. You know, it's always inspiring as a prosecutor when you get to meet uh, the victims. Uh, and while sometimes our defendants could embody the very worst of humanity, it seems that invariably our victims embody the very best of what it means uh, to be human. And uh, in this case, it was no, no different. Uh, I've gotten to know the families and I'm inspired by them and I'm impressed by their patience uh, and by their, their dogged uh, persistence in not only supporting uh, their, their lost uh, sisters or, 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 or mother uh, or, or daughter, uh, but also really, uh, you know, really standing for victims a a everywhere. So I want to, I want to, I want to thank them all uh, so much. Uh, and I want to let them know that we're going to continue to work this case. Um, the next thing I want to do, I just want to thank, I th want to thank uh, our yeah, partners. That was very well thank, done. Uh, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison. Um, you know, we said it was a change. And when we talked about, you know, not going before the media, if you see, um, you know, Rodney did go before the media, uh, but it was always in a very controlled manner and it was always with a controlled purpose. Again, we did that because we knew we were playing before a, an audience of one person. Uh, and so I want to thank Rodney for his partnership. Uh, most importantly, I want to thank Rodney for his integrity. I think in the past, what the reason why uh, uh, these various investigations fell short was because there was a lot of outside influence, a lot of people who had nothing to do with the investigation, nothing to do with the, um, uh, the, the uh, investigation or any of the agencies that were actually handling the investigation. They still asserted pressure on those investigations. That did not happen with our task force. Our task force were, was run by our members, uh, and we did uh, what we thought was in the best, uh, the best investigative steps and what was in the best interest of the, of the investigation. So I want to thank Rodney for that uh, and, and his whole team. I, I know that we have Suffolk County homicide here, Kevin Beyer. Uh, we, we, we've got uh, Inspector Rowan. Uh, and I know that they've been around, and I know that they're here, and I know that they stand in the shoes of their past investigators, 
and I want to congratulate them, and I want to thank them for their partnership. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Sheriff Errol Toulon. Everything I said about uh, Rodney, I could say about Errol. Uh, Errol uh, is an unbelievable partner. So uh, this does sound like it was great police work overall. Basically, what, what they were doing was they kept getting bits of evidence that they could then take to a grand jury, and with each step, they could get more affidavits um, or warrants to get more information and then bring that back to a grand jury. He said they had something like 300 um, warrants and affidavits all in all over time. So this, this guy's Rex Hewerman is the suspect. He's an architect in Manhattan that lives in Long Island. So, so thank you, uh, Sheriff Toulon. I wanna thank um, the FBI. I know um, Assistant Director in Charge Michael Brodak is here. I want to thank his entire team. You know, when you have the FBI, uh, not only do you have tremendous resources uh, and insight, uh, whether it's the Behavioral uh, Sciences Unit, whether it's CAST, uh, whether it's CART, which is their computer unit, but you also have the ability to seize a car in uh, South Carolina. I can't seize a car in South Carolina without uh, the FBI. So, so thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for your partnership. And thank you for, for, for your willingness uh, to work with us. I want to I want to um, thank the New York State Troopers. Uh, I know Major Udis is here and his team. Uh, you know, uh, this case is is emblematic of, of great cooperation, but we always get that same level of cooperation from the state police, uh, no matter what uh, case we're working. So I want to thank them. Their investigators did a great uh, um, uh, did great work on this job and uh, in this case, and we couldn't have done it without them. Um, lastly, I want to thank uh, Nassau County Police Commissioner Pat Ryder. I don't know if he's here. Did he make thank it? you guys for the support. <laughs> um, this guy is, you know, is this this case. This, it's it's as really I said, sick. Spans if, you know thir thirteen if, years. If and what they're saying time, is connected to him, really is. Um, Pat Ryder has been this guy's sick. Whoever did it is clearly started, sick. I think he was a sergeant. Uh, the uh, sergeant, maybe uh, uniform sergeant. The, the sadism whatever, here is really striking, right? So he. Uh, Whoever, whoever the suspect or whoever actually did it um, apparently did call. So one of the victims had a younger sister and she, within the, the week after the victim went missing, uh, got calls from her sister's phone that were a taunting voice uh, doing this several times saying like, are you a derogatory word like your sister was? Like just incredibly sadistic, um, make, makes me sick, honestly probably clouds my analysis. It's good afternoon. Today is a good day. And before I acknowledge the individuals that had a role in getting to this place, I would first and foremost I'd like to offer my deepest condolences to the family members. To the family members of Amber Costello, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman. I can only imagine what you had to adore. Absolutely. Over the last decade, regarding knowing that your killer was still loose. God bless you. So I've had, I've had the privilege of being the police commissioner it's nearly about two years now. And uh, I have had that investigative experience in the NYPD uh, as a detective, as the chief of detectives. And when I was going through the process of being the police commissioner, my engagement with the county executive was I was very familiar with this unfortunate homicide, homicides. And I wanted to let it be known that this was going to be our number one priority. But I also want to make this very clear, that this arrest was made by the investigators assigned to the task force. I announced during a press conference 18 months ago about a new team effort 
that was going to investigate the homicide, and that was going to consist of people from Ray Tierney's office, from Mike Brodack, FBI. Mike, thank you so much. State Police, Steve, appreciate your support. <clears throat> Dr. Earl Talon, Jr., thank you, sir. As well as the investigators from the homicide detectives in Suffolk County. Gentlemen, thank you for all you've done working together with us, making sure we are here today. I also want to thank my partner, Pat Ryder. Pat, good seeing you, man. And uh, former NYPD police commissioner, Keisha So I'll say, the, uh, the mitochondrial DNA here I do think is really strong. <clears throat> so this was a, a degraded hair sample that they could get mitochondrial DNA from, which they ultimately matched to mitochondrial DNA from uh, residue when they were surveilling him. We've heard it's a pizza crust from the uh, New York Post report of his, his bail hearing or, or paperwork. So I think the difference between mitochondrial DNA and other things you hear about like trace DNA or touch DNA is in the sample itself. So the issue with touch DNA or trace DNA is they're just swabbing objects and then they're seeing if they replicate that, massively replicate whatever they find on an object, they can get some kind of DNA signal. But in the case of mitochondrial DNA, you have a sample that you know is human material, right? So you're not just swabbing something like they did in the Ramsey case. They were just like swabbing things, right? Uh, in this case, they had a hair. And so they couldn't get traditional DNA, but they could get mitochondrial DNA that was from the cells of a known human tissue sample, right? So I, th I think it's really strong evidence. Fresh eyes on this case and the resiliency of our investigators allowed us to identify Rex Hurman. Ladies and gentlemen, Rex Hurman is a demon that walks among us. Strong words. A predator that ruined families. And if not for the members of this task force, he would still be on the streets today. However, even with this arrest, we're not done. There's more work to do in this investigation regarding the other victims of the Gilgo Beach bodies that were discovered. I'm going to encourage anybody that still has information, call our Crime Stoppers hotline. No, he's so I believe he's he's uh, set he's incarcerated without bail. That was the justification for no bail included the DNA evidence. That's thank why we, that's why they work. actually included that so that he couldn't Deputy get out on bail. Anthony Carter, both of you who provided update information regarding the case and let it be known if there was any resources that they needed that you brought it to my attention. Since the discovery of the first victim, there's been a lot of scrutiny yeah. and criticism regarding how this investigation was handled. I will tell you this, the investigators were never discouraged. They continued and, and uncovered evidence and followed leads. They never stopped working and will continue to work tirelessly until we bring justice to all the families involved. Last but not least, I want to thank my predecessors uh, that came before me, the work that they did. I want to thank them for really uh, laying the foundation that helped us get to here today. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Brodak. I'm the FBI Special Agent in Charge of the New York Office's Criminal Division. The FBI expanded its full set of resources in support of our local and state partners to advance this investigation. The charges show that we can overcome the most difficult challenges when federal, state, and local law enforcement work together under one task force. While nothing can fill the void caused by the loss of a loved one, through today's announcement, 
We are hopeful that the families of the victims begin to experience a sense of peace, closure, and justice, and that the general public feels safer knowing that an alleged killer is no longer roaming free. The actions taken today should serve as a reminder that the FBI, along with our law enforcement partners, will continue to be resolute in our determination to bring all offenders to justice, no matter how many years has passed. I would like to thank Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney and his prosecution team, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison and the Suffolk County Police Department, the New York State Police, and the investigators and staff of the FBI New York Field Office, including the Long Island Violent Crime Task Force. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Errol D. Toulon, Jr., and I'm the sheriff of Suffolk County. I would profoundly like to thank the district attorney and the police commissioner uh, for including me not only here today, but for including the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office and recognizing the importance of jail intelligence. It is extremely important when you realize that we created our human trafficking unit in 2018, that there are victims in our community and that intelligence is being shared by many of the men and women who are incarcerated today. And we have seen many disjointed investigations occur and leading up to the leadership of these two men have really brought everything together. I am proud that today we stand here a little bit closer to bringing closure to the families and extend my deepest condolences to all of you. Because of the nature of this case and recognizing that human trafficking and corrections intelligence is so important, we realize that there are many other cases that are going on that will, we will help to solve going forward. So I thank my intelligence staff and team that are here today for their diligence and their work. While we did our part in this investigation, we continue to So, that yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Do killers like this just stop killing, or might there be more recent victims? Um, I, I, think, I think it's possible that killers like this stop killing. They have... Some, there, there have been some cases of a very long cooling off period. Uh, that was the case for BTK, for example, right? There's this sort of almost like manic period of killings, like they're, they're binging over a long period of time. And then for some reason, there might be something that distracts people for a while. But I would say it's more common that the urge stays. Let's see what this guy says. Well, losing a loved one, you can never completely get rid of that pain, but hopefully these steps that are taken here today are a step in the right direction for you to start in the healing process or work through the healing process. I want to thank the members of the task force, all the agencies you see behind me. When we were approached in 2022 to be part of this task force, we were fully engaged. Um, glad to be part of this. Uh, we, we assigned investigators on a full-time basis. You know, what, what you see um, being done here today is, is the end game of agencies working together, as it was said before, with no egos, all egos put aside with the sole mission to find justice for these victims. You know, um, here in, in Troop L, Major Steven Yudis oversees the operations down here. He has been involved. So there's only been one, one suspect implicated and arrested. His name is Rex Hewerman. Um, he is charged with three um, murdering three of 10 suspects. We're getting some kind of mixed messages on whether they think all 10 are related to him. BTK was uh, the nickname of Dennis Rader. Uh, BTK stood for Bind, Torture, Kill. I'd like to take this opportunity to start off by acknowledging the DA, Ray Tierney, and Commissioner Rodney Harrison for having the vision to see that forming a task force might breed new light into this investigation. The state police were asked in early 2022 to join this task force, and once requested, we were more than willing to do so. We were also very pleased that we were able to make some very meaningful contributions in this case to help propel it forward. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the task force members from the different agencies and congratulate them on a job well done. I think this case represents an example of what we as law enforcement can do 
when we pool our resources together and we work together. I would also like to mention the state police member assigned to this task force. You were provided with a mission, and that mission was to participate in this task force, put everything else that you were doing aside, assume, place 100% of your attention on this case, and help push this case forward. You more than accomplished that mission. I congratulate you on a job well done, and I commend you for your outstanding work. To the families, I'd like to say that on behalf of myself and the New York State Police, we offer you our deepest condolences. We recognize that these crimes may have happened years ago, but that pain continues. Our hope is that this development today provides you with some relief and some comfort, knowing that the person responsible for, the, for your loved one's death is now being held accountable. And he's no longer a threat to anyone else. Inside. Right. So I would liken it. I would liken it to an addiction. I think it's a very, it's a extremely disturbing addiction. It's essentially an addiction to uh, a combination of sex and violence. Some situation where violence and sex have been combined and lead to this kind of like escalating need to get uh, more and more sadistic with it. Um, but insofar as it is causing this rush. You know, people that, that get addicted to things can have, a, can have a long period of that addiction. They can have then a long period of sobriety from it, but then they can relapse. So I think that's probably the most analogous sort of process to uh, sadistic serial killing, as sick as it is. And their void and their loss was great pain, and they did not deserve this. Nobody is deserving of this. We hope this development today will bring some comfort to them as they move forward. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? You know, uh, sure. Before I do that, I just, you know, I'm, I'm standing back there. I realize I didn't thank my own team. Um, so uh, so I, I want to thank, uh, thank my chief investigator, Rick Zacharis, uh, who is uh, without, uh, I am so lucky to have. Sounds like a lot of people thank, were involved uh, in this Nick case. Santa Martino, ADA Nick Santa Martino. Uh, and ADA they work together Michelle well in Dodd, the end. ADA uh, Andrew Lee. Uh, I also want to thank my, my chief uh, assistant, uh, uh, Alan Bodie, and I want to thank all of the incredible, incredible analysts uh, that we have working for us at the Suffolk County DA's office. So uh, ha having said that, I'll now answer your question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that there was a tension in, in, in the task force, and it was a, it was a, it was a good tension uh, because, you know, there's a tension between getting the, the evidence necessary to charge somebody, but also keeping the public safe. Uh, and that's the tension that we always deal with. Uh, so as we were working forward, we were, and, and you know, we had uh, Suffolk County PD, we had the FBI uh, surveilling the defendant. Uh, obviously, that can't be all the time, uh, but we were, you know, we were reasonably assured with that. Uh, but this individual was, was, was a person that continued to uh, patronize sex workers at all hours of the night. Uh, he continued to use fictitious um, um, uh, email addresses, fictitious identities, burner phones. Uh, and so as we, we worked through the case uh, and we got closer and closer, uh, all of a sudden, uh, and we built the evidence, suddenly the balance tips uh, in favor of, uh, of public safety. So, so he, he seems to be uh, saying you know, there. We, we wanted, we all wanted as a task force. For many continue, years but, since the killings, uh, collectively we this guy was still. It was going to sex workers, but to, to, presumably know, not killing them. And, and, and to take him off the street, so that's what we did. I, I don't believe they, uh, does, that, does anyone, anybody want to say anything? But I definitely agree with you no, guys in they're, the, they're in the here, chat. They're, they're, this I is tell you the pure predator uh, pretending uh, to have feelings. And Brainerd Barnes uh, family members, but uh, they're here. Uh, they're here first and foremost to support uh, their loved ones, and we're, we're, we're happy and grateful to have them here. Have 
The, uh, this, this portion had to deal with the deaths of these four young women, uh, and that's what we focused on. That was what the grand jury investigation was focused on. I talked about the commonalities, uh, and the commonalities, uh, uh, all of those commonalities that we talked to were uh, unique to these uh, right. four so, separate cases. Right, so farm girl nurse doc. Uh, that's what we're, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that that might be the case. I, I don't know. You know we're going I hope not. Continue. Continue to work and investigate and try to get a small measure of closure for all the victims' families. But for right now, uh, this defendant, uh, it's this defendant with these 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 uh, these four victims. Um, I'm 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 here to talk about uh, what we did with regard to these four victims. And as I I open my my. Um, my ad address by talking about the need to maintain uh, investigative secrecy. So we are going to maintain that investigative secrecy. And when I talk about other individuals and other cases, it will be after they have uh, they have handcuffs on. The so. I mean, you know, we talked about uh, we talked about you know some of the evidence that was there. Uh, you know, obviously the cast uh, that that's, uh, that phone evidence uh, was 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 great evidence. Um, and then there were other commonalities. There were other inve uh, investi uh, investigations. But I think one of the good things about having a task force is basically you strip it all down uh, and you start from scratch. And then you use the DA's office because the DA's office has to get you uh, li the lifeblood. Of, of an investigation is information. And the way you get information on a cold case is the district attorney's office issues subpoenas in conjunction with the investigators and execute search warrants, again, in conjunction with the, with the, um, uh, the investigators. And, you, and then, you, then you mine all that data, and then, and then you let that data take you where you need to go. So that's what we did in this case. And six weeks in, uh, the, uh, the break in the case, uh, a significant break in the case, was uh, was the uh, was the avalanche and the fact that this guy, uh, you know, he was described by witnesses as an ogre. He 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 matched the description of the ogre and where he lived. Was the avalanche of the link there? Was that right? So well, I mean, it sounds like so they had the burner phones. They had these phones that were used to contact contact each sex worker victim. So those phones, with those phones, they they made a box of cell tower records of where the person was. Then they had witness testimony when there was a sex worker that actually had been contacted by him, but had men with her that descended upon him and intimidated him. Now they had witness testimony and a car. Once they could implicate him and find his cell phone records, they put him in that same area and they keep building evidence from there. March 14th. I agree. He sounds like Patrick huge, Bateman. Huge actually. day for the task force. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's never one piece of evidence. Well, there's, I mean, there's, there's like the, what they, they'll call lawman searches. And basically what it is, is, is you run a certain make and model of a car and certain other, you know, where you live or, or what you do for a living. And then you get data and then you mine that data for something that would, would, would uh, match with, uh, with, your, uh, with your case. And you do that, you don't do that just, you know, you do that a hundred times, you know, until, until it hits, until you get the right data points. So we can't we, we can't talk about um, we can't talk about uh, ethically in New York. We can't talk about any statements the defendant made. But he, uh, you know, he made. Uh, we're not turning over any statements. Uh, so. <laughs> um, I would say he was yes. Yeah. So the, in between the in between the bed and the. And, I think the, the question is: the, Was he surprised? Head, there's like a little triangular. And the answer was uh, he was um, ornament almost, and it, it's it's unique in the way it's configured. It's unique to to the avalanche. It was unique to the avalanche at that time, uh, and that was something that was pointed out by by witnesses. What? Well, you know the investigation is is continuing, and and I would never say never, um, and we're going to continue to look at again. Now th this is a, a watershed event in the in in this case. Uh, and so we've now uh, are going out and we're, we're ex executing more search warrants. We'll get more information, more data, 
and you know, together, uh, we'll look at that and see where it leads. I'm sorry? I wish you would repeat the question. Uh, uh, so, so this investigation had to do with... Um, I think the, a prior question was, uh, did he seem surprised these, when you arrested victims, him? So we've been in touch with the four victims. And he said, to me, he did. jury uh, process. Um, with regard to victims in general and, and other victims, uh, you know, who lost people in the vicinity of that area, you know, we speak uh, to, to our victims all the time, but that, that's, those are conversations that we keep between ourselves. So, uh, you know, it, it's, um, uh, so first off, Maureen Brainer Barnes, she, the, the other uh, three, one, uh, one was, was, uh, was went uh, uh, missing in 2009, uh, I believe the others in 2010. Um, she was in 2007, so it, it, was, it was a little bit more remote in time. Uh, we are, um, we are uh, pro uh, working through evidence. A lot of that evidence has to do with forensic evidence. Uh, and analyses that are not completed, uh, but once those analyses are completed, uh, we are we are uh, we feel good about the case, and we're going to just continue to let that process go. And again, I think the the, the, the um, initial plan was to allow the grand jury investigation to go a little uh, further, but uh, at a certain time, uh, again, the, the task force felt, you know, we need to uh, we we for for for. for Reasons having nothing to do with the evidence in the case, we need to take it down. Can you sum up this defendant? You've seen a lot. Can you sum up this defendant and what he did? Um, you know, he's, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, as a prosecutor and as investigators, you know, he is charged with a crime. Uh, there are certain elements in which we, ha we need to prove that crime. We are going to prove those elements. We're going to work hard. We're going to convict him, and we're going to hold uh, him responsible for what he did. And whether, you know, what I think of him personally, whether I like him, whether I don't like him, whether I, it doesn't matter. We are going to hold him responsible for what he did in this case. Um, the grand jury is, um, it's uh, secret. Uh, and we're going to keep it secret, um, uh, but we have an investigation, and it is continuing. There was a belt that was presented to the public by the Sunshine Police Department a few weeks ago with initials on it, and I think one of the officers from the undercover made the investigation. Obviously, it's got a nature of things. Sure does. I agree. It was a great job by all of these agencies working together. It was good old-fashioned police work, it sounds like. Or WH, yeah. So he's got an H in his name, and other um, other relatives in, in his family have a W in their name. So a belt. What that means. I don't know. A belt is a piece of evidence that was found uh, near a near the dump site. Leather belt with WH um, or HM, depending his, on whether it was uh, internet searches, upside down or right side up. Um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, provides a little uh, in, uh, in, insight into his state of mind. Um, and again, we don't have to prove motive. We have to prove the elements, and that's what we're going to do. Well, f f uh, you know, you you, uh, you, know, you said women. Um, you know, with regard to the sex workers, what we did was uh, we, we had them under surveillance. Uh, we had other means of monitoring him, uh, and again, it's uh, it's a um, it's a process, and and that process is you have to balance uh, the ability to to to, pr to find e enough evidence to charge him and hold him responsible with the balance of keeping the public safe, uh, and it's it's not easy, uh, and we decided at a certain point in time that the you know that we needed to take him down because we didn't feel comfortable with it, so that's what we did. He laid out a lot of evidence, though. Um, I don't think it was so much. Uh, I don't. I don't think it was so much uh, uh, the searches. I think. I think that the conduct of the defendant was was very consistent. I think, but uh, the the quality of our evidence was increasing uh, by the by the by the day by the moment uh, due to the great work of our, our task force uh, uh, partners. So at, at a certain point in time, we're like, okay. 
uh, you know, we can, we can do this. Uh, the uh, uh, the um, uh, I believe the uh, the cause of death is homicidal violence. Obviously, uh, given the length of time and 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 the exposure to a very harsh environment, uh, forensically there there uh, was not uh, you know not a, a lot that that could be done with with, with the remains other than uh, come to that conclusion. He has uh, he has. Uh, he has uh, uh, permits for 92 guns. He has a very large safe in which guns are kept. Uh, we are uh, continuing to um, execute search warrants, so I'm sure we'll have that uh, answer uh, shortly. Is there a gap between when the last time the arrest I'm sorry? I think there's, I think there's, uh, with, there's always concerns. I think, you know, we, I, I got into office in January 22. Uh, we worked with our partners. We, we had our first meeting uh, February 1st, uh, and we worked. And, and, you know, March 14th was really that watershed day. And when I tell you, you know, I'd like to brag and say that my office was really working hard, which we were, uh, but no other agency was working any less hard than we were. Once we realized what we had and we realized the stakes, all of our partnership, uh, all of our partners really worked. Uh, I mean, I, I think if you look at, at the folks standing here, uh, I don't think that, you know, uh, in the last 48 hours, any of us have gotten more than three hours sleep. It's talking pretty well for only getting three hours of sleep in 48 hours. Uh, we are going to continue our investigation, and when we are prepared, when we have concluded that investigation, uh, we will, uh, you know, we will we'll bring that uh, to a conclusion, but we will not do it before. All right, thank you. Do you have one more? Okay, between all the search warrants and subpoenas, do you ever, like, do you ever think they should, they should be able to lose them? Like, you know, we need to do all the searching around and stuff? Like I, you know, and I don't want to tell you, you know, exact uh, investigative techniques because they're, you know, again, Part of the what reasons why they're um, effective is because people don't necessarily know what that uh, what what it is exactly we do, but uh, always a concern. But given the professionalism of our partners, uh, their diligence and their commitment, uh, we felt good about about the case uh, or keeping the case going until we didn't, and then we took it down. Thank, Th thank you. you, thank you, guys. The press conference from the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. All right, so a lot more, a lot more information than I thought we would get from the DA. Really laying out his case. Um, some really strong words by you know him, essentially indicating he's certain they got the right guy, and uh, talking as if he's certain they'll get him uh, convicted for these four. Uh, actually, four murders. I misspoke earlier and said three. Um, and then the chief of police actually called him a demon. Uh, that was one of his leading statements. Rex Huerman is a demon. Um, so they, they definitely seem pretty certain. Um, of course, he has not been tried yet. Presumed innocent uh, or presumed not guilty until such time but so I think the things that, that stick out for me in terms of just the, the evidence they got, uh, so definitely the mitochondrial DNA, which I was talking about earlier, you know, it sounds like they have multiple hair samples that they'd gotten from the victims, you know, at the crime scene. Eventually, we're able to get mitochondrial DNA. Probably they knew it was from a male, you know, maybe they had enough sample to get general stuff like there's a Y chromosome in the past. Once they could do the more advanced analysis, they get a full DNA uh, sequence. Uh, then they get residue from Rex Hewerman. Once he is a significant person of interest, they're surveilling him. They get a, a pizza slice that he discards is what I'm hearing from the bail documents. 
Uh, they also get residual DNA from family members to sort of further, uh, probably further support that this is a match uh, between Hewerman's and the uh, crime scene samples. So they have that. How did they get to the point where they were surveilling him? It sounds to me like uh, a couple of things. One was that they had these cell phone records. So they knew that someone was using temporary phones, a different phone for each victim. Uh, they had sort of cordoned off an area where they knew the person must have been operating based on those cell phones. And that was actually one area in Long Island and one area in Midtown Manhattan. They are presumably starting to look for people that match a certain profile. Um, there's probably stuff they're leaving out in, in that investigation. But at some point, they also get witness testimony from uh, a sex worker, again, who, who was they said something like participating in a ruse where uh, so she had met with or she had been contacted by a John, right, who was trying to to pay her for sex. She got the money, but then had accomplices, men who came in and intimidated the guy out of there. So from those uh, from those people, they, they knew that this was a six, four ish guy, large frame who drove an avalanche. So now they have additional information that they can be sort of looking through their potential suspects, you know, who owns this kind of car, who fits, the, uh, who fits this build. And then once they start looking at Rex Hewerman, they see that his cell phone, his personal cell phone, is lining up with the burner phone data in terms of uh, the phones traveling together for periods of time. So, um, you know, I... I I'm, I'm impressed with the level of police work that we're seeing here. I am dismayed by how apparently disturbed this guy was. They also had gone into um, his Google searches and talked about the, the violent pornography. I suppose it's not surprising, right? Like someone in the chat um, mentioned uh, who said BTK before. Uh, one, one, sorry, one of you pointed out that that sort of torturous uh, sadism uh, was a significant part of the mindset here. Uh, someone else pointing out Patrick Bateman. Um, and so that's that Patrick Bateman's from American Psycho. And the, uh, the thing about him was that he had this normal life, but, you know, admitted to wearing a mask in his normal life and that what he was actually into was uh, sadistic murders of sex workers included. So, uh, yeah, again, I think it's, uh, it's, it's someone whose primary drive is this pathological id. So the id, you know, is the, uh, primal urges. So like food and sex. And in some cases, some people would say aggression is a primal urge. But normally these things are sort of uh, channeled through healthy outlets. Um, you know, we, we find ways to satisfy these urges in uh, sort of moral ways, right? Um, even if aggression is a pure urge, we can channel that through sports or exercise or uh, healthy competition, right? Um, this is someone whose id seems to have combined sex and violence or aggression and has then sort of uh, taken on this power that's essentially controlling his life. Um, and the, the ego, the, the normal sense of self, is just sort of a, uh, subservient to, to meeting these pathological drives. Uh, and you know, I, on some level, he had to have just been going through the motions of living a normal life, right? It's very hard to imagine that he really was having normal feelings about his family and his work life when his parent uh, hobby, when they were away, like, uh, like the DA was saying that they looked at the family's records and it was when his wife and kids were gone that he um, targeted at least three of the victims uh, when they were out of state um, to be doing that when your family's away. I mean, it's just, it's so far afield from, from, from what I could imagine as like a normal thing to do when your family's away, like, you know, watch, watch sports, um,
drink a beer maybe right but uh it's it's just it's so far afield that it's it's hard to conceptualize in any way other than intraspecies predator right predators are uh, a phenomenon that exists in the natural world but in the non-human world predatory behavior tends to be uh you know a carnivore targeting an animal for its own subsistence now they do do certain things like target vulnerable animals you know the wounded caribou um intraspecies predator essentially means that that same set of behaviors predatory behaviors is happening in a human and getting applied to other humans yeah yeah it's it's really intense i mean uh i think one of the one of the things that that makes even starting down this path is so dangerous because there seems to be something about it for susceptible individuals, psychopaths, that once they get a little bit, they have to keep escalating. Uh, so it, I, I, I would be surprised if these four were his only um, victims, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you guys for, for watching. Uh, I actually have to have to go on with my day myself, but... I really appreciate you guys being here for my first live stream. I thought it might be good to do when I saw that there was an arrest in the Long Island serial killer uh, case. So I really do appreciate you guys uh, coming out for it. I, I, I can't, I cannot imagine what it's like to be his kids or his wife. Um, I think actually we keep talking about BTK, but I think there is a, a documentary that I haven't seen about that. That's from the point of view of BTK's kids. So it, it might be telling uh, to watch that if, if there's some insights to be gleaned there. It does seem like it would be pretty heavy, though. It doesn't sound like a fun watch necessarily, right? Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, let's do it again sometime. Bye-bye.